Finding the fountain of youth has captivated scientists as well as emperors and kings and queens of the past. In the year 200 BC, for example, Emperor Qin was the first one to unify China, but he was getting old. So he told his princesses, go out and find the fountain of youth, and if you can't find it, don't come back. Well, as a consequence, in 200 BC, all these ships went out throughout Asia, and we think they went to Japan, and because they couldn't find the fountain of youth in Japan, they decided to create Japan. That's probably where Japan comes from, in fact. Today, we scientists believe that we now know what aging is. Aging is the accumulation of error. It is information loss, entropy. That is the essence of aging. The information loss could be in the form of genes. Genes could degrade with time, so the cell no longer functions like it used to. Or protein molecules can be broken. Many ways in which information loss takes place inside a cell. Now then the question is, is it possible therefore to correct cell information loss? That is, genetic repair mechanisms. That we don't know. At the present time, we do know that there are genes which can repair damage inside a cell. But we don't know whether we can correct all the damages created by the aging process. Now how would we do this? Take the genes of an old person in their 80s and 90s. Take the genes of somebody who's 20 years old and compare them. What we find is that aging is concentrated in about 60 genes inside the body. They're the ones that have most of the damage. So if you can then repair the genetic damage of most of these 60 genes, then it may be possible to extend the human lifespan. Now believe it or not, already we can double the lifespan of yeast cells, fruit flies, worms, mammals, going all the way up to certain primates. Now we can't do that with humans yet, but it's amazing that we can double the lifespan of every single living organism that we have looked at on the planet Earth. However, to do that, you have to starve the animal. The animal has almost no caloric intake, becomes lethargic, body temperature drops a bit, and it loses all interest in sex. Well, wouldn't it be great if we can have the benefits of caloric restriction without the after effects? That's where the scientists at Harvard and other places have achieved modest success. They've identified a gene called SIR2. SAR2, we think, is perhaps the gene responsible for the benefits of caloric restriction. So it is conceivable that in the coming decades, we will be able to have a genetic mechanism that can duplicate the benefits of caloric restriction without having to live like a hermit. So I would say that perhaps in the next 50 years, who knows for sure, we will find mechanisms by which we can repair genetic damage and therefore begin to extend the human lifespan. Now I should also mention that at the ends of chromosomes, we have something called telomeres. Cells divide about 60 times, then get lethargic, and then die. We now know the reason why we have this hay-flick limit. At the ends of the chromosomes, we have like the ends of your shoelace. You know that if you tie your shoelace often enough, the plastic tips fray and your shoelace disintegrates. Same thing with chromosomes. Every time a cell divides, the telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter, like the fuse of a time bomb. Once a cell reproduces 60 times or so, the telomeres have worn out and the chromosome disintegrates and the cell goes into senescence and eventually dies. Now we can stop the clock. A few years ago in Menlo Park, a corporation there was able to take telomerase, hit it with ordinary cells, and these cells are immortalized. We now have human skin cells that don't divide just 60 times. They've now divided thousands of times, and they are in some sense immortal without becoming cancerous. So I think it's tantalizing now that we have many clues as to the nature of the aging process itself, but it may take several more decades before we can manipulate the aging process.